I was, I was asked this question recently, and it reminded me that perhaps uh, we don't mention this too often. Uh, a person asked me, why do you teach verse by verse through books in the Bible? Doesn't that keep you from being led by the Spirit? If the Lord leads you somewhere, you're, you're kind of already stuck in that passage. And, and I thought to myself, well, you know, we do do topics periodically when the Lord leads, but our, our main kind of deal, our, our main way is to teach verse by verse through a book in the Bible. And the reason we do it is because, well, you learn it that way. It's written that way. Most of the New Testament are letters except for the Gospels. And, you know, if I wrote you a letter, you wouldn't open it up and read the middle of it and then jump to the beginning and then jump to the end or, or just jump around. It, it wouldn't make sense to you. So you get to know not just verses and topics, but you get to know the Bible and why it was written, who it was written to, the context and how you apply it to your life. And we find that as we teach through it, uh, it's amazing how the Lord deals with very specific issues that are going on in our lives and in our culture and in our time. You know, we're in Romans right now. And I went to Bible college for four years. I went to seminary for three years. And I learned all about the Bible and theology and all kinds of different things about the history of the Scripture. But it really wasn't until I started teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, that I really got to know what the Bible was all about. And we're going through this book, Romans, and, you know, the first 11 chapters kind of set the stage for the last 12 through 16, because the first 11 chapters are all about who God is, you know, what he has done, all that he has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And it also speaks about when we are in Christ, how we apply him being our Lord and our Savior. And, and, and then we pick up these last chapters, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, and it talks about relationship, relationship, a relationship with God, our relationship with the church, with one another, relationship with people outside the church, Christian, non-Christian, and how to respond in a relationship to government, to authority. And all of that has to do with what I call the immediacy of time. Maybe I could phrase it like this. What are you doing right now with all that God has done for you? What are you doing right now with all that you know about him? This is kind of the question that, that, that rises to the surface here at the end of chapter 13. The immediacy of life. The importance of the way we live with the understanding of the time that we live in. Because we live in a very interesting time right now. They did in those days. And, and Paul speaks, I believe, because of the inspiration of the Spirit, not only to that time, but also to your time and my time. Listen to what he says. We'll begin with verse 11, chapter 13 of Romans. And do this. He's calling us out to do something. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And he's not talking about your coming to Christ, that type of salvation. He's actually talking about the final event of salvation when Christ himself returns for us. The night, hey, verse 12 is far spent. This, this darkness since the time of the fall is coming to an end, he says. The day is at hand. Therefore, because of all of this, let's cast off the works of darkness and let's put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daylight. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, 
not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no excuses or provision or don't set yourself up for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now, now let me have your attention. Time, it's a mysterious thing. I, I, one of my daughter-in-laws told me the other day that she had some cousins over that were spending the night with her boys, and they were begging her to stay up till midnight. Can we stay up to midnight? Can we stay up to midnight? And most of us are like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to stay up to midnight. Can we stay up to midnight? She says, yeah, you can stay up to midnight. And while they were busy, she set the clock ahead three hours. <laughs> I thought, man, that is genius. <laughs> Time. If I said to you, Hey, how was your time at the beach? You might say, well, it was, it was great. The water was clear. It was beautiful. The sunset was awesome. We, we did some paddle boarding. We saw a dolphin. We ate some seafood. My time at the beach was great. Now, you, you didn't talk about chronology of time. You talked about quality of time. You talked about your experience in that time. Well, in this passage here in Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is talking about both. He's talking about chronology, how it's far spent, the day's almost here. But he's also talking about the type of time, the days that they live in and the days that you and I live in, the, the kind of time that we're walking through right now. Here's what Paul is saying. It's the end times. Look what he says there. And do this knowing the time that now it's high time to wake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. The night's almost over, he says. It's like the little boy who had one of those clocks in his home that would chime and his mother had taught him how to keep time, you know, when it hits 12, it's midnight or it's noon, and he would, he would listen so he would know what time it was. And one time the, the clock malfunctioned, and it chimed bong, bong, bong 15 times. And he was like, and he ran into his mom and said, Mom, it's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> and that's the time we live in. Certainly if Paul expected the Lord to come back then, it's a lot closer now. You say, well, I don't know, John. Oh, we live in that kind of time. And if he doesn't come for us in the air, he's certainly coming for each of us individually. In that time that the scripture says, it's appointed unto each man and woman a time to die. He's coming. Somehow, some way. Every time you hear a siren from an ambulance, it reminds you that there's a time. The number our days. We, we live in this crazy, mysterious thing called, called time. And, and, and as you grow older, you know, every ache, every pain, every joint, every, you know, thing that you experience is kind of like a reminder. You look in the mirror. You see that gray hair. The hair growing out of your ear. You, you, you see that wrinkle. You see that spot. I, every funeral you attend, you think of chronology. You think of the time that we live in. That, that, that's, that's going by. It's passing right now. It, the, t the time, the clock, it's ticking and it's gonging. And, but there's also a quality of time, a type of time he's talking about. The end times. And we could go into all kinds of ways to look at what the Bible says about the end times. One thing I want to mention to you, which I think is so prevalent right now, is it's a time of, it's a time of globalism. We live in a time, the scripture says, in the end time, that the world will come together and there'll be a one world ruler and it'll be a, a one economic ruled globe. We live in a time of globalism. When other nations have issues and America has uh, impact financially by China or whatever nation it might be, it impacts the whole world. 
We, we live in a time scientifically and technologically and medically where we're all tied together and we're racing towards certain kind of cures to cancer and, and COVID and all. It, it's a very global world that we live in right now. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's just like that. And it's, and it's happened very slowly, but all of a sudden, it's here. I mean, travel is part of it. When we used to be able to travel around the world, and people still can, and if they dare, but there's this intermingling of cultures like never before through travel, through food and clothes and language. I had a friend in from San Diego uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, he had his 16-year-old and 18-year-old son. They were over at our house, and, and I was talking to him about his kids, and he goes, you know, my two sons have both had three years of Mandarin Chinese. I said, get out of town. You're a surfer. They don't know Chinese. He goes, no, they've had three years of Chinese. I go, why? He goes, well, we were going to teach them Spanish, but we didn't want them working in a taco stand. So we thought we'd teach them Chinese because they're going to be running the world one day. I thought, wow. It's a global world that we live in. It's not hard to see. It's not hard, hard to understand. We, we, we share so many different things and been impacted by this glow. And sports is another one. I mean, when I grew up in high school and junior high school, and if you're near my age, not too many people played soccer back then. There was no soccer teams when I was, it was football and baseball. Now, everybody plays soccer. It's this impact of globalism where sports have been touched, where, where, where environmental things have been a big concern with, with all kinds of issues that go on with that, that impact economy, impact everything. Military equipment, communication, the, the exchange of, of these different cultures and nations over technology that have to do with protecting one another. That, that's the kind of time we live in. We live in a time where everything has become very global and we live in a time when things could be set up very easily for a one world government and a one world economy. We live in that time. It's an amazing time like no time ever before. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We live in that kind of time when unexpectedly he could come. In Luke chapter 21 and in Matthew, it lists some things about the end times. Nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes. Anybody heard about any earthquakes recently? It says there'll be, you know, various places and famines and pestilences. Pestilence could be plague. We're in a pandemic right now. It talks about famines and fearful sights in the heavens. You know, you don't, we don't think much about famine in our country, in our world. It seems like, I mean, how many of you out there are struggling with, with, um, You just don't have enough to eat. I would look around the room and my, myself and say, hey, you're eating something. But look at this statistic I want to bring up. On. Th these, this is a 2020 statistic of people who have acute food insecurity across the world. We live in this kind of time globally. We live, I believe, in the in times. In Matthew 24, there's an interesting passage of Scripture. It says, and because lawlessness will abound. Of course, that's not abounding in our world today. Certainly not lawlessness. Not anarchy. Lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. And I want to stop there for just a second. The love of many will grow cold cold. Hearts grow cold. Lawlessness increases. There's this global mindset and reality that we live in. This word cold is an interesting word in the Greek. I, I said, what does that mean, the love of many will grow cold? It's, it's a 
it's a, it's a word that has to do with mind. It has to do with soul. It has to do with emotions. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mind of worldliness. It's that word. It's kind of attached to that same word when Jesus says, I would that you'd be cold or hot, but you're, you're lukewarm. You've, you're growing cold. We actually get this word from the Greek word that has to do with a cold breeze. We'd kind of like a cold breeze around here once in a while. But it's the word psychos. And it talks about the hearts of people, their soul, their mind, will grow psycho, worldly. That's what it means. Cold, hard, selfish is what it means. It also has roots in the term, they will grow medicated. It has to do with sort of a dullness of the heart and perception of, of caring and feeling for others. And it can be tied to even being medicated. 44% of Americans take some kind of medication, and the primary one has to do with emotional and mental issues. Psycho. There's a worldwide wind blowing through this global thing we live on that has to do with the times in which we live. Paul says, based on that, not just speaking to them, but I think the spirit, the spirit always leads to speak to the next generation. He says, and do this knowing the time. You can't ignore it. You can't close your mind to it. You can't sleep through it, he says. It's high time to wake out of sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Based on the time we live in, Paul says, it's time to wake up. It's time to, to, to not be lulled into activity or lethargy or some kind of sleep-induced sleep, sleep thing, not, not responding to the time, but respond, he says. Wake up. If you go back to the context in chapter 12 when we are being told now it's time to respond to all that the Lord has done, all that He is, all that He's given, and all that we are in Christ— in verse 1, where we begin this, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He started there, and he said, wake up. Don't be conformed. Don't be lulled to sleep. Recognize the time you live in. And he's continuing to make application all the way through the next five chapters. In fact, the very theme of Romans has to do with us waking up and bringing us back to what we're supposed to be doing together and individually as a believer. Uh, this, this verse uh, is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is the theme of the whole the whole. Book, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. Listen, that's what we've been called to do, to share the gospel, to be about the gospel, not to be lulled to sleep, not to be pulled into the world, not, not to find ourselves living for those things that don't have to do with Christ. Paul is addressing Christians here, and he speaks about the kind of time that we live in. So today, I just want to talk about it. I want to talk about that you and I know that we're nearer to the coming of our Lord with power and great glory than any other generation in history. It's just we are. That's the time we live in. Our call, our task, our purpose is same as those in the time of Paul and in the time of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was, was uh, on the Mount of Olives and he's, he's going up into heaven, the disciples are all watching and gazing. An angel says, you men of Galilee, why are you, why are you standing there gazing? This same Jesus shall so return in like manner. And the Lord had told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 8, it says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the exact times 
which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. And this was his mandate then, and it's his mandate now. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth in the panhandle of Florida. Witnesses. And so Paul brings us back to our mandate. He brings us back to, to who we are and to wake up. And, and he's calling us not to be lulled to sleep, especially as we recognize the times that we live in. What kind of time do you think we're living in? What do you think about this pandemic? Well, what do you think is going on in the world? Do you, what do you think God's doing? Do you, he, he, you say, well, John, are you saying God's the one who sent COVID-19? I don't think so, but I certainly think he's using it to awaken the world, to shake the world, to remind the world. And so Paul goes on and he says this. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Walk properly as in the day. So he says, leave, leave your darkness behind and clean up your act. Put on the armor. You're in a spiritual battle whether you realize it or not. Listen, many of us, well, I would say it's all of us. Every single person who claims the name of Christ sitting in this room right now. You're in the spiritual battle. You have things you're tempted by. You have darkness that you dabble with. You have things in your life that the enemy would love to use to kill, steal, and destroy. And, and Paul says, recognize the time you live in and come on, wake up. Let's be about those things he called us to do. Walk out your life in broad daylight. That's what he's saying. Stand up, he says, and speak up and, and live up. You know, you, you are in Christ. And it's time, he says. It's time to live for him. How many of you here have ever had an argument with your spouse? Anybody? Has it ever been heated? Has it ever gotten loud? None, none of you, are, you have arguments like this. Yes, dear. I understand. I love you too. We'll get through this. I know. Then you pat each other and pray. Sometimes it gets loud. But say you're in a, in a public restaurant and, and, and things begin to, the, the, the conversation goes south and now you're, it's getting kind of heated and, and there's people sitting all around. It tends to remain still pretty under control, right? But if you were at home, be dodging pans and whatever happens. This is kind of the imagery. He says, walk like you're in the broad daylight, like people can see you. Not like you're in the darkness and no one can watch and no one can tell what's going on. He said, no, live like you're in the daylight, in the open. And then he describes what that means. He, he goes on here and he says, uh, let us walk properly as in the day, not in partying, which is the word reverently, and drunkenness. It does not be all about this party and drunkenness. And See, in Rome, they, they worshipped so many different pantheon of gods. They just had them everywhere. And one of their gods was a god called Bacchus. He was the god of wine. He was the god of alcohol. And so he's addressing that in this Roman culture, in this time that, that they were living, that it's easy to, to, to step into that world and carry along that past with you that you once had and, and to be drunk. And sometimes they'd be drunk for days. And sometimes because of their drinking for days, they became addicted to being drunk. And they became alcoholics. And because they were addicted to it, they made bad choices. Their inhibitions would be lowered during that time. L listen, here, here's what he's saying. Live like you're in the broad daylight, not at night in drunkenness. And, and it may be that, you know, there's someone the Lord's speaking to here today who no one knows, but you're a closet alcoholic. 
You, you, you're one of those people who no one really knows it, but man, I got to have a drink every night. I got to have a drink every day. And the Lord would say, hey, come out of the darkness and into the light because that lifestyle leads to choices and he begins to describe them. Lewdness and lust, strife and envy. And this the wording and the, and the terminology he uses there for lewdness is lust is, is just, it's about as low as you can get. It's, it's sexual encounters with no boundaries. That's what he's talking about. We would look at it today and say it's probably like a doorway to pornography, which who would have thought that we would reach the place in our culture, in our day, in our time, when anybody and everybody can access it with a click of a finger and it has no boundaries. And the Lord would be speaking to someone and saying, hey, come out of that. I, I didn't save you to be in bondage to that. Come, come out of the drugs and the alcohol and, and the sex and the lewdness and the lust and, and the pornography and the, the whole, whole gender thing that is, is being imposed upon the culture. It's, it's a crazy time. And the strife that occurs because of it. And he doesn't tell us just what to stop doing because that's not what it means to be a Christian. Well, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. And I... Okay, well, what do you do? And he instructs us in that. L listen to what he says. Let us walk properly, verse 13, as in the day. Not in drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not, not in strife and in envy, but, but here's what you do. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no excuses, no provision. Don't set yourself up for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. It's all about Christianity. It's not all about what you don't do. It's really more about what you do. That, that's what defines who you are. Well, what, what do you do? He says, well, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make, make no provision. Don't set yourself up. Don't go where you shouldn't go. Don't, don't let your mind take you where it shouldn't take you. And, and put off the old and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because that's what you've been called to do. And that's because of the time and the type of time that we live in. People need to know, to hear, to see that there is reality in Christ. And guess what? He's calling you and me to do that. Not somebody else. Wake up. Don't fall asleep. Don't, don't allow yourself to be medicated, intoxicated, and, 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 and you know, be lulled into lethargy. Where What do you do? Well, I don't do nothing, but here's what I don't do. No, no. What do you do? What, what does it mean to, you know, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he uses these very specific terms, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a conscious Deliberate acceptance of Jesus Christ as my Lord. Just like we go back to, I beseech you, therefore, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service because of all that he is and because of all that he's done. So put him on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be submitted to him. He's in control. And I think it's a daily thing. It's not like, well, I did that. Oh, how about tomorrow? You know, you get up tomorrow, guess what you got to do? You got to get dressed again. You ever notice that? Every day, well, some of you maybe just stay in your pajamas all day. But most of you will get dressed. And thankfully, you got dressed today. Right? So you got up and you, you put a shirt on or a blouse or a dress or something. I got up this morning, I got dressed, walked into, my wife has a little office, she was in there doing some stuff, I walked in, she goes, oh, you're dressed, I go, well, yeah, oh, I like that shirt, oh, thank you, and so this shirt's been on me all day, I put on some pants, some shoes, 
all of us put on some clothes. And those clothes, for the most part, will go with you all day long. Put on Jesus in the morning. And take him with you wherever you go. Make him a part of your day. Make him a part of your thinking. Make him a part of your interaction. Make, make him a part of, of who you are and call upon his power, his wisdom, and his love. I would say it this way. As you go through your day, and here's what I try to do in situations. Say, Lord, I want to be yielded to your spirit. Not my spirit. But, Lord, I want to be yielded to the Holy Spirit in interaction, in, in, in my activities today, in my conversations. You say, well, John, I, I try to do that. I, I do a pretty good job at it. But there's a one area of my life, you see, that, well, I struggle here, and, and I've always had a problem with this, and I, I don't know if I'll ever overcome it. I, I deal with it. I was just born that way. Well, here's the problem. If you're a Christian, you were born again, right? If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You're not the same old person. You weren't born that way when you were born again. You were born brand new. And life starts over for you. It starts over for me. I'm a new creature in Christ. Make no excuses. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't allow yourself to be pulled into that lethargy, that sleep. Or What do you do? I don't do nothing. Here's what I don't do. I don't know. I don't care what you don't do. How are you putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? L listen to Paul. Listen to what he says. You, you and I know that we live in a time that's closer than any other time. I mean, just, just by the sake. If, 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 if we were to know anything about the coming of Jesus Christ, we know this. He's coming quickly. You know, in, in the book of Revelation, it's interesting. In the 22nd chapter, Jesus says this in verse 7. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Wow, Lord, that's been 2,000 years ago. I know. And then he says it again. He, he, he says it again in Revelation uh, verse 12. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work coming quickly, I'm coming quickly. And then Jesus says it again in verse 20. He says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. I say that to say this. If Jesus in the book of Revelation three times in, in chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible and the last book of the Bible says, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly. What do you think Jesus is talking about? He's coming quickly in our time. And Paul says that we should wake up, that we should put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should have a deliberate, conscious, everyday practice of saying, okay, Lord, I'm putting you on. I'm stepping out there. I'm putting on my armor of light. I'm walking as if I'm in the daylight. I'm going to live this out for you because that's who you are and that's who I am. And I want to be ready. Remember the story of the ten virgins? I think it's in the book of Matthew. They, they had their, their, their oil and their lamps and, and they were waiting for the bridegroom and, and they all fell asleep. And he came and said they awoke from their slumber and five were ready and five were not. I think there's something a part of the book of Romans that we're going through here that in the times that we're living in that says something to us powerfully. And I, and I want you to listen. Just listen for just a moment. Tune everything else out and let the Lord speak to you. The night is far spent. Are you, are you stuck in the darkness? Are you trafficking in that world? It's high time to wake out of sleep. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I had a guy come up to me after service, and he, he, was, he was a little older than me, and he, he's just visiting, and he's got a ministry in Atlanta, and we were talking, and he asked me a bunch of questions, and he goes, 
how old are you, John? I go, why? He goes, I'm just curious. I said, I'm 24. <laughs> he goes, no, you're not. I go, no, I'm, I'm older than that. He goes, I want to pray for you. I go, okay. And he prayed this very sweet, very gentle prayer about time. He heard the message. Let's cast off the works of darkness. W would the Lord be speaking to you today about something that needs to be cast off in your life? Something that if it was brought out in the broad daylight, cast off the, the, the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. He's saying, let's be ready. Let's fight this fight. Let's walk properly as in the day. Not in drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no excuses or don't set yourself up for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And I think sometimes we know when we're doing that. I always take it back to those kind of things to my ongoing life struggle with 10 pounds. You know, you lose a little weight and you're driving home, you think, Man, you know those, um, those nacho Doritos? Those things are pretty good. Yeah, but you can't eat those. Yeah, but they got a new kind out. They have a new kind out every week, John. I know. Well, I'll just get a bag. I I'll just eat a few. And then that night, when the food monster comes into your room, and he's growling, and next thing you know, the whole bags. Well, they don't put many chips in there anymore. <laughs> Make no provision for the flesh, whatever it might be. And, and, and Paul's challenge and, and my challenge to myself, to you, to us, is think about the time you live in. Think about the time you're in. Think about the place you are right now. And, and I, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, speak to me, to us, about what it means to wake up and to live for you in the day that we are in and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk as you live in broad daylight. That's our challenge. Amen. That's our call. That's who we are. And don't let the enemy tell you any different because he would love to. Thank you.